Yeah, welcome and good morning, everybody. First of all, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the plenary presentation, Understanding Res Responsivity of Metal Organic Frameworks. I would like to thank especially the organizers for inviting me. Of course, it's a pity not to be in Brighton at the FESA, but to be here in Dresden, but I hope you can still enjoy the lecture and one of the most fascinating topics in my view is the responsivity, the dynamic behavior of metal organic frameworks, a unique feature as compared to rigid porous systems as zeolites and most of the other MOFs. And this is what I would like to talk about um, today. So uh, I will briefly um, explain the organization. Let me just take a, a pointer here. <clears throat> So um, I will give you an overview. First of all, I will start uh, with an introduction and then I will try to illustrate the understanding and mechanistics of um, breathing and flexing mechanisms by illustrating a few model systems, in particular the breathing MOFs and the new phenomena which we now call negative gas adsorption transitions. And in the last part of my presentation, I will also illustrate new phenomena that are uh, better understood by understanding and investigating um, well-known model systems, the so-called pillared layer metal organic frameworks. And then throughout my presentation, I will try to illustrate how important it is to develop in situ characterization methods that allow you to analyze structural changes along the adsorption isotherm and pathways. And I will close my presentation with uh, uh, a few applications or functions that are coming up. I will try to illustrate the unique features of flexible MOFs and try to give an outlook. So let's start with the history of flexible MOFs and it's quite interesting to see that all of you know there are the famous MOF5 and HCAST1, the early MOFs that are now produced at the ton scale by companies like BSF or Numart in the US. And with the discovery of these um, highly porous systems, already the first flexibility phenomena were observed, not in MOF5 or HCAST1, but um, the first observation of a flexible uh, MOF that can reversibly change its structure was uh, a MOF now called ELM11 for elastic layered material number 11. So responsivity softness is ultimately associated with the structure of metal organic frameworks. However, it is still uh, a smaller number of metal organic frameworks that show these type of um, phenomena. And many, many people, of course, have contributed to the field. I tried to name the most important ones, but there's always one I will miss probably. There are many, many people working on this and I will just try to illustrate the most important findings here in the history of these flexibility phenomena. Um, soon after ELM11 was discovered, MIL-53 as the most important breathing uh, system was discovered. MIL-88 is a swelling system that shows a huge volume change in the presence of um, vapors. Uh, excuse me, in the uh, presence of, of liquids. And then we discovered also DUT8 as a prototypical model system showing the largest volume change ever observed for a gas. And then already the first applications came up. Jeff Long proposed that we can use these flexible MOFs in natural gas storage. Um, the, the shape memory effect I will explain later was discovered. And then in recent years, more and more new counterintuitive phenomena were uh, discovered. And I will uh, in particular address these negative gas adsorption phenomena that uh, we have described. So many people contributed to the field um, in terms of materials development, but it is also very important here to name uh, people like uh, Lee Bremer or uh, Professor Babur, who developed in situ uh, technologies. But that, what is also uh, very um, important to name the people who developed theory like um, FX Kudea, um, Alex Neimark, and of course, Professor von Spieberg, I forgot here in the list, but she's also uh, one of the most important uh, people developing these theories further to under to get a, an understanding of uh, theory and and flexing behavior flexibility phenomena in MOFs. Let's start with the history. The first flexible MOF discovered was ELM11. At that time, the structure was not very well understood. 
recently and Kaneko measured adsorption isotherms and found a very strange behavior that you can see here on the right hand side. Depending on the activation conditions, you find a very strange behavior where the moth is first closed and then at a certain very specific so-called gate pressure, the sudden, suddenly there's a, uh, a huge gas uptake and um, this is associated to a structural change. Let's look into the structure. It's a layered structure. It basically uh, has just mononuclear uh, copper uh, complexes that are connected by bipyridine struts to form a 4-4 net. And these 4-4 nets are not pillared. They are just inter-stacked. Uh, they are just stacked layers, basically. And the, the green tetrahedra here are BF4 anions. And in the um, contracted form, the BF4 anions of the upper layer block the pores of the lower layer. So there's no uptake. And only if you reach a certain gate pressure, then the layers um, separate from each other. They pop open, and then the moth takes up a lot of uh, gas. And these phenomena are never in equilibrium. They are associated to um, pronounced hysteresis in the adsorption isotherm, which is also a characteristic. So here we have a lot of activation barriers from the point of guest view and then also from the point of the um, structure. Nowadays, um, several uh, structural phenomena are known, uh, different structural mechanisms. The very simple one that I just described is the stacked layer mechanism, but uh, Ferre's group discovered the breathing mechanism. It's a two-stage transformation from an open pore form to a contracted pore form and to an open pore form again. And here you see also other mechanisms like the catenated moths, they form a rattling type uh, system, or you can even have linker um, rotations that are locked and open. So they have also a molecular switching mechanism inside the pore. And what is recently more and more coming up are also external stimuli that are different from only a molecular guest. They include a stimulus such as an, uh, an optical stimulus, light or electrical fields, and people are even dreaming of mag magnetic stimuli that could change the structure in interaction with a molecular host, uh, a molecular gas that responds and changes the structure. On the right hand side, you see the most prototypical adsorption isotherms and phenomena that were discovered here. The gating I described for ELM11, a very pronounced hysteresis, a steep uh, adsorption uptake when the structure opens. The, the breathing is more like a two-step transformation from an OP to a CP to an OP form structure. And then there are even more complex phenomena like the multi-step adsorption isotherms and then associated to multiple structural transformations. And then also recently we, di we discovered the negative gas adsorption transition, which I will illustrate more in detail in uh, a minute. In order to get really an understanding, it is key to investigate structural transformations along the adsorption isotherm. Otherwise, you are blind. It's just a curve and you don't know what's going on. So what can you do? Of course, the best method or one of the best methods is to do diffraction because you get an overall impression about the global structural uh, changes. And nowadays, in situ diffraction, neutron diffraction, X-ray diffraction uh, technologies are available, special cells that allow you to measure a full isotherm on the cell, on the material. And at the same time, the material is in a cell in the synchrotron beam. You can do all the Rietveld refinements of all the um, intermediates. But there are also other techniques that are important. The NMR spectroscopy is in particular important when it comes to amorphous systems. Or if you want to analyze what is the recognition, what are the structural changes for the guest uh, molecule? How does the guest molecule orient in the pore? And nowadays, high pressure NMR is available, static solid state NMR uh, measurements uh, for high pressures, gas pressures up to 20 bar. And even EPR technology has been developed that allows to monitor paramagnetic guests inside the pore or local strain uh, changes in the framework that are associated to um, electro electronic uh, um, differences arising from ligand deformation when you have a complex transition metals are of course great for EPR spectroscopy because their unpaired electrons can be in 
many cases monitored by EPR spectroscopy. Not to forget UV-VIS and Raman spectroscopy, which are also important uh, methods. Our favorite MOFs are highly porous systems. We are maniac in developing higher and higher porosity. We have done this for many, many years. And our record, and this is currently the world record material, is DUT60 with a pore volume of five cubic centimeters per gram. This is a mesoporous crystalline MOFs, all pore. Pores have the same uh, pore size, are identical. And um, this um, adsorbed volume, nitrogen adsorbed volume, is one order of magnitude higher as compared to typical zeolites. It's really the world record type of material here. It's also the world record in terms of apparent BET surface area. Of course, we are all aware of the limitations of the BT theory, um, and there are more theories to be developed in the future because there's still a lack of analyzing accessible porosity with a surface area. And um, I think there is a great importance in developing new theories and uh, improving this field because the theories that we have are not appropriate anymore. Uh, Randy Snow has proposed the simulation of apparent BT surface areas, which is quite useful, but it doesn't help in measuring and um, accessing or addressing the accessible surface area of a real sample. So there's still um, important methods to develop. And in order to do this, I think it is important to change our community in terms of publishing data. We tend to publish data as curves, as a graph in a publication. And the NIST database has started to digitize these data by taking the curves and reanalyzing them. But in this way, a lot of information is lost, especially at low relative pressure. Only in a logarithmic plot, you can see the high resolution isotherm at low pressure. It would be much more suitable and appropriate to um, submit with your publication all the data in a, in a human readable file format. And the crystallography people have done this for decades. So whenever you publish a new crystalline material, you have to uh, submit a zip file, which contains all the crystalogra crystallographic information. And we propose this year in Langmuir that you submit in the future your adsorption data as an AIF file, an adsorption information file that is machine readable, uh, human readable and machine readable. But then people all over the world can analyze the data and, uh, and develop new models, simulate adsorption isotherms. And I think this will be quite important for also developing machine learning uh, further. So when you check the ISA webpage of MOF, the MOF ISA webpage under the button adsorption, you will find the programs that allow you to convert your machine volume adsorption isotherm from an instrument uh, file into such a um, human readable file format. And we are developing this continuously further. So please take this into account for the um, quality of your publications in the future. With this, I come to one of my most favorite metal organic frameworks, which is DUT49. It's a very simple structure in terms of rationalizing it. I will try to explain it briefly. It consists of a bent carboxylate, the carbazol dicarboxylate linker, and uh, we form with copper here six pedal wheel units that connect these carbosols together into a so-called MOP, a metal organic polyhedron. This metal organic polyhedron contains six pedal wheels and 12 dicarboxylates, carbosols. That means that we have uh, 12 nitrogen atoms on the corner of a metal organic cube octahedron. This, you can consider this MOP as a sphere, which is a 12 connecting building plot. And my student uh, Uli Stöck had uh, at that time, 2012, the idea to connect these MOPs with a biphenylene strut. And Honkai Joe has also presented a similar concept using a phenylene um, strut. But this made up the DUT49 topology. And you know the structure by heart because you are a chemist and you all know the structure of copper, which is a cubic closed packing of spheres. You can also consider this as an ABC, ABC packing, which characterizes the uh, cubic closed packing of 
über Metal Spheres or anions, oxide ions in, in many, many crystal structures. So this is just a CCP uh, cubic packing of spheres. And these spheres are connected by the biphenylene strut, as you can see here. And um, um, what you also know is that in each cubic close packing, there are octahedral and tetrahedral voids. In a metal, you can fill them with hydrogen atoms or nitrogen atoms. This is important for steel technology, for example, and only a tiny atom fits into the cubic close packing. But here we have MOPs connected by these biphenylene struts, so the pores are huge. 24 angstrom, 17 angstrom for the octahedral and the tetrahedral void. And then we have also an additional um, micropore, which is only 10 angstrom, which is the uh, cube octahedral void itself. So it's a hierarchical pore system on the edge between micropore, the micropores material and a mesoporous material with these 2.4 nanometer size um, pore. In 2012, we were mostly interested in natural gas storage. And this material at that time was the, was the world record leader in natural gas storage. It could take up 540 milligram per gram at room temperature at high pressure in total absorption capacity, much higher even as compared to the record leader at that time, MOF 177. It was the world record in 2012. And this motivated us to try to get deeper insights and get an understanding why this MOF is so special to absorb natural gas at high, uh, at high pressure. So we started to measure absorption isotherms at the boiling point of methane, which is 111 Kelvin. And what we found is there's a very strange absorption behavior. This MOF takes up a lot of gas, 30 millimole per gram at low pressure, but then shows a negative step in the adsorption branch of the adsorption isotherm. Then we find a plateau, and then we find another uptake, which is huge, almost 70 millimole per gram. This is huge. And what is also really strange, the negative step amounts to 7 millimole per gram. This is 100 65 standard cubic centimeters per gram, which is what a zeolite would typically take up. So this MOF is pushing out gas. It's pushing out gas. It's making basically at, along the adsorption branch while you're increasing the outer pressure. This is completely counterintuitive and has never been observed um, before. It's a new phenomenon. And first of all, we were very critical because it's thermodynamically forbidden that the MOF is desorbing during the pressure increase. And therefore, I um, asked my student to repeat this uh, experiment several, several times. First, we thought the machine is wrong or the cryostat is broken, something is wrong. We repeated it with different companies, volumetric instrument. We repeated it with gravimetric instruments, but we always found the same reproducible, totally reproducible um, behavior. There's a negative step in the adsorption branch, and this was the new phenomenon, negative gas adsorption. Now you may say, how do I care methane 111 Kelvin? That's a lab curiosity. No, you can observe this in your lab at room temperature when you do an adsorption experiment with butane. First, there's an uptake, and then there's a negative stack step in the adsorption branch. And my student Simon Krause had the very great idea to film the sample during this um, negative gas adsorption step. So you can enjoy what the sample is doing along the adsorption branch here. We are approaching the negative gas adsorption step. And what you will see now is that the gas is coming out of the sample. In the middle of the sample, there's gas coming out, gas evolving, which is basically lifting the sample up. It's a very strange behavior. The sample is moving up. This is a real-time video. And then after the step, it's coming down again. And it's coming down deeper than it was located before. So from this very simple visual observation, you can already tell there's huge structural transformation going on. And here we have developed a platform technology that allows you to in situ measure the structural changes in a special beryllium cell. So before we are approaching the negative gas adsorption step, the sample is in a large volume cell with 
100,000 cubic angstrom cell volume. It's a cubic system as the CCP uh, packing. But then after the negative gas adsorption step, there's a huge contraction to a cell volume of less than 50,000 cubic angstrom. And um, this huge contraction, you can uh, analyze all the structural changes, is associated with a pore contraction. The mesopore of 24 angstrom is contracting to a micropore of about 9 angstrom, the red one here in the center. Only at high pressure, the material is reopening, opening up again, and it's almost achieving the original cell volume again as um, defined by or refined by the Riedfeld refined method of this synchrotron data. So this is a breathing moth. It basically contracts the mesopore, which is in the middle here, the orange one, is 24 angstrom. And in the negative gas adsorption step, it's contracting to less than one nanometer, about nine angstrom. And this is the reason for the push out of the gas. The uh, MOF cannot accommodate all the gas in the pore and therefore in the micropore, it's pushing um, the gas out. But what is the underlying reason of this uh, very strange phenomenon? And Jack Evans together with FX Kuder has beautifully analyzed the energetics of this type of transition. So here you see the energetic curve, the uh, energy of the system versus the cell volume on the x-axis. Uh, and you can see that on the right hand side, this is the open uh, structure where the phenylene bridge is straight. So it's very happy. It is not deformed at all. And um, this is the global energetic minimum if, if there, as long as there, there is no uh, gas present. But what happens when you go to the contracted pore form here on the left hand side, you see that the linker is bent. Ooh, it's very unhappy. So it takes a lot of energy to bend the system. So this is energetically unfavored, but it's also a local uh, minimum on the energetic curve. So what the heck is the reason for the transformation then if this is unfavorable? It is the adsorption enthalpy. The adsorption enthalpy for methane and um, Paul Jacomi in the group of Philippe Luellen at that time and today in the group of Guillaume Morin has measured the adsorption enthalpy for the CP form and for the OP form. And for the CP form, it's much higher as compared to the OP form. So heat is released when the MOF transforms from the OP to the CP form because the CP form has a higher uh, adsorption enthalpy for methane in magnitude, of course. And you can see this also from the simulations. When you approach an intermediate filling, the local minimum becomes the global minimum in the curve. So the CP form is stabilized and only then at higher relative pressure along the adsorption isotherm, the OP form becomes again the global, global minimum and you see the reopening. What is beautiful is that today, and this was a cooperation of Jack Evans and my group and Toon Westralen's group, uh, um, who beautifully showed that nowadays it's possible to simulate the full energetic landscape of this phenomenon. And here we look at methane adsorption at 120 Kelvin. And um, this is very important because it allows you to understand that this is a phenomenon that is related to energetic barriers. If the system would be in equilibrium, there would be no such uh, negative gas adsorption step and there would be no hysteresis as expected. And this is what you see here in the simulations. To illustrate this on the left hand side, you see basically this is similar like diving. If you like diving in the deep sea, the deep blue color is basically where it's very deep and the yellow is where it's uh, very shallow, the, the water. This is the energy landscape basically. On the x-axis here, you have the cell volume and, and the y-axis, you have the increasing pressure. So in equilibrium, the MOF stays in the open pore form, then at an intermediate pressure transforms into the CP form. It always tries to be in the global minimum energetically, and then it reopens again at higher um, pressure. But this situation is totally different when you take into account the huge barriers that are have to be overcome to transform from the OP to the CP and vice versa. And this is very fascinating to me 
We start here in the adsorption branch in the OP form, but the system cannot overcome the barrier, the, the yellow um, mountain on the left hand side, so to say here. It cannot overcome the barrier and therefore it traverses further along the OP in the OP state. And only in an overloaded state, it suddenly has to transform into the CP form. Because it was overloaded, it says, oh, I have too much. And it's pushing out all of the gas. It's transforming into the CP form. It's pushing out the gas. And that's the reason for the negative gas absorption. Then it's reopening again and going to the OP form. But when we look along the desorption branch, what you can see here, we start in the OP form we transform into the CP form. But what is also very interesting is that this simulation shows we stay in the CP form. The moth is sort of trapped in the CP in a contracted pore form state because it cannot overcome these barriers anymore. It's contracting further and it's sort of um, arrested here. So nowadays this shows how important um, simulations are, um, how well it, it uh, illustrates and leads to an understanding of these counterintuitive new phenomena. You may also be able to try to understand this phenomenon from the point of view of the guest molecule. And we have done neutron powder diffraction studies in situ to localize CD4 molecules, the deuterated analog of methane, in the pore. So we have localized, and you see here on the right hand side the uh, the movie, how the moth is filled. And on the left-hand side, you can see the green, blue, and orange curve, which represents the different pore fillings. And what you can see is that the negative gas absorption step is very close to the step where the mesopore filling starts, which is the, the orange part here. And this is our current hypothesis that the negative gas absorption transition is associated to delayed mesopore filling. And um, here I would like to also um, inform you that there is a very interesting presentation by Muslim Dwayashkin, who recently measured also PFG NMR, which also demonstrates that there's no pore blocking, but in fact, the mesopore filling starts basically right before the negative gas absorption step is uh, coming. This is also sort of in um, agreement or coincides um, with the observation that all gases can induce negative gas absorption. Of course, I'm not sure if all can do it, but we measured a lot of gases, methane, ethane, ethane, propane, butane, nitrogen, argon, xenon, etc. Many, many gases. And for all of them, you can see there's a maximum value in the negative gas absorption, the, which qualifies the push out, the amount of push out. Here the maximum was observed for argon and it's always very close to the boiling point or actually what we found is that there's a relation with the critical temperature of the gas and this also demonstrates that this is a critical phenomenon that is associated with a capillary condensation um, phenomena. Of course there's more to analyze and I'm happy to discuss or cooperate with people who are interested in this um, topic. The beauty is now we can analyze all the different gases and what they do. And what is more beautiful than looking into xenon adsorption? Because xenon feels the pore size. It knows how large the pore size is. And Eike Brunner has developed a system that allows you to measure xenon adsorption isotherms and in parallel measure the chemical shift of the xenon. We start in the open pore form. We have a chemical shift which is low here. And then once we transform with the negative gas absorption into the CP form, we have a huge chemical shift because the pore is shrinking. And the pore is then filling further. There's a a, a further shift and then at larger relative pressures here, this is the adsorption branch, the OP form appears again. There's a coexistence which also can be further analyzed and then in the end we have only the OP4, OP form uh, coming up. So this is sort of the eye of the poor maniac, uh, the xenon adsorption which allows you to analyze the pore size distribution along the adsorption pathway. But there are also many other phenomena that are important affecting flexibility, not only the structure. And um, uh, Kitagawa has pointed out this for the first time in a science paper on the shape memory effect, that 
it matters if you have a nano crystal or a normal macro or here it's called micro sized crystal. This so called shape memory effect means that a nano sized crystal has a different responsivity as compared to a macro crystal. Here it retains the open pore form after dissolvation and only transforms after heat treatment, while the macro crystal directly transforms into the um, CP form. On the right hand side, you can see how this affects adsorption isotherms. For example, a gating MOF will change its behavior completely. It will become rigidified and show a type 1 isotherm. There are even effects in um, flexible systems where a system switches from non porous, non switchable to a gating MOF. In NGA, there's also important effects, which I will illustrate in a minute. And in breathing, there's also similar observations, a stiffening due to the particle downsizing. And the breathing can be completely suppressed if you have a, um, a nanocrystal of the same um, material. So whenever you talk about structural tuning of flexibility, first, you have to make sure that your crystal size is well-defined and known and comparable. This is here illustrated for the effect of negative gas adsorption. Um, for small crystals around 0.5 micron, you find a type 1 or type 1b isotherm, so typical rigid behavior. Only for large crystals, approximately starting around uh, 4 to 5 micron, you find a nitrogen adsorption, uh, a flexible behavior. Uh, the breathing and negative gas adsorption transitions. And if you are in between, then you find a behavior which is in between. And of course, this is also um, gas dependent. So the particle size effect may also be uh, different for different gas because this counteracts the particle size effects and the nature of the um, gas. But I wanted to point this out because uh, it is really important to to um, specify the crystal size before you can talk about um, structural tuning. But we can do structural tuning. And this I will show here for the NGA materials. So it's very simple in uh, theory to understand. Basically, we have a bending mechanism here. So um, you know when we go from the open pore form to the contracted form, the linker is bent, basically. and um, this determines the energetics and there is a very simple rationalization taking into account the Euler's law. When you have a column, there is a critical pressure that you can apply before it buckles, yeah? before your temple breaks down basically or your church with the column breaks down. And this uh, critical load is inversely dependent on the length of the column if you keep everything else constant. Yeah? So if we only look at the uh, column length, we expect a softening of the columns um, with elongation of the, the linker. So Simon Krause in his PhD has beautifully shown and demonstrated this. He has shown the whole elongation series. Unfortunately, the DUT151 with four fennel rings is an interpenetrated system, so we cannot compare it directly. But what we see here is basically the short ones are the stiff ones and the longer ones are the soft ones. The short ones show a type 1 isotherm or type 1b isotherm, DUT48 and DUT46, typical rigid behavior, no transformation. Only the DUT49, and this is DUT50 here, the second MOF that showed negative gas adsorption um, flexes. And look at this. This is an even higher uptake, above 80 millimole per gram. This is a huge gas uptake, what these pore systems can take. And as I said, for the interpenetrated system, it's a bit more complicated. There's a rattling type of uh, mechanism that we see here. If you can take this rationalization into account, you can also think of just tuning the elasticity module, making the column material thicker, so to say, making the columns thicker. This is the elastic modulus. So Simon Krause in his PhD has made the columns just a little bit thicker. For example, you can use a pyrene core and you see immediately this is butane adsorption here. You go from DOT49 to DOT147 and you move from a flexing system to a rigid system. 
even a very small manipulation, only introducing two methyl groups here in DUT149, this is not published yet, unpublished work actually, only this small modification already re um, in, induces some small amount of stiffening and allows us to measure rigid behavior. And here you can already see that the hysteresis is taking um, taking a chance here starting. So we are on the verge to capillary condensation in these type of materials. So what I wanted to show as a main part of my presentation was uh, the different, how you can tune flexibility in uh, metal organic frameworks. It's of course the building blocks, the linkers, the nodes that determine the stiffness, but, but it's there's an orthogonal factor that is crystal size. There's a critical size, a critical dimension, where you go from a flexible to a rigid behavior. Um, there's also the effect of dissolvation stress that we have recently published in a Christ and Com paper. So it also matters how you prepare your moth from which solvent you dissolve it. There are other effects that are not well understood yet, surface deformation and sample history, which I would uh, wanted to explain, but the time was not enough. But I would, uh, what I would like to briefly address is also the phenomenon of um, disorder. And for this, I would like to take a more simple approach, a more simple system. This is a pillared layer system. Um, here we use a pedal wheel node. We can use any type of uh, metal here, but nickel is the most prominent uh, one and a naphthalene dicarboxylate sort of linear, almost linear linker that forms these four, four, um, um, nets and um, these nets are pillared by a linker called DAPCO, it's an NN donor linker. And this is one of the um, most prototypical gating MOF systems that I can think of. After dissolvation, it transforms into an activated phase because the Van der Waals forces minimize the energy by stacking of the naphthalene uh, cores, basically. And then when you absorb a gas like nitrogen, you see a steep uptake and a huge uptake of almost 30 millimole per gram. This is very good for a, um, a gating MOF um, system. So, what I wanted to illustrate here as a new phenomenon is the importance of disorder. This system originally we found in 2008, we published for the first time in 2010, but we still did not understand the structure fully. And now we think we understand it in a much better way because what we um, considered in cooperation with the Goodwin group very carefully is that this linker in fact is not exactly linear. It's a step function. It can go up and down, up, down, up, down. And when you consider this and you form loops of these four, four nets, then you can have different um, orders. They can be down, down, up, up or they can be up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And this leads to different motifs that you can see here on the upper uh, part of the slide. It's like a staircase, you know, you have different motifs. This is the one where you have basically um, up, up, down, down. And this is the one where you have down, up, down, up. And I don't want to go too much in detail because please read this paper. It took me five years or six years to understand this. It will not be able to explain this in five minutes or even in, in, in one minute, but there's a simple approach. You can think of these building blocks as tiles and just look at the different colors. They have different symmetry, they have different color. And what we found is that you can combine these tiles in a defined way only, but in many, many infinite and countable uh, uh, ways, basically. You can either have only one tile, one color basically, or you can color only one, you, you can combine only one uh, type of tiles that are colored here on the left-hand side, or you can um, even have the situation where only these gray and dark gray uh, colors are integrated, which is an ideal tetragonal structure, which, oh, which, which without going too much into the details of crystallography, um, here. So you can almost form a phase diagram and what was most fascinating for us was to find out that with a guest you can have a 
very well defined. The guest determines the disorder in this system. So each patterns differ just a little, little bit, but if you analyze them carefully with the help of Andrew Goodwin, you find that each solvent defines a very specific disorder type. One, for example, DCM is more close to tetragonal. Others that are here on the bottom, NMP, are more close to uh, monoclinic. These are sort of the extreme cases. So whatever solvent you exchange, you come to a defined, very complex disorder state. And what was most fascinating to me is to find that we can switch in between these defined disorder states. From the S synthesized material, if we exchange first with DCM, we find the more close to tetragonal structure. But then when we exchange DMF, we go more to the monoclinic one. When we exchange DCM again, uh, we go to the tetragonal DCM. And this is not a dissolution mechanism because it happens very rapidly in minutes, basically. And this is a new type of disorder switchability in a huge configurational landscape. They are um, countable, but infinite number numbers of these uh, disorder states. And I think this is a totally new direction in a sense, because it points to the fact that these metal organic frameworks can have multiple type of configurations, a much wider config configurational um, landscape. And Matt Rosinski has pointed this out beautifully in his Nature paper in 2019. Um, for another example, with a different mechanism, these peptide-based MOFs, not a disorder system, but peptides that have quite different configurations that they can take. And this makes the landscape much, the energetic landscape, which is shown here on the bottom, much more um, complex. So this is one of the main differences as compared to a rigid zeolite that you can see on the left-hand side. It's a very a uh, monotonic landscape, it has one minimum, it's stru structurally rigid, but this landscape is much more um, saddled, so to say, and has many, many uh, local minima, and this is more akin to enzyme type of chemistry. And my vision is that we can not only tune the landscape, the energetics, but in future we will also be able to tune with chemistry the energetic barriers in between the different minima. Because the energetic barriers, and this is of course complex, but the energetic barriers determine the kinetics and the rates of the transformation. And this would allow us to tune metal organic frameworks in time, along the time axis. And this is what I call four-dimensional metal organic frameworks, which is, I think, a new paradigm in the area of metal organic frameworks. And this can lead us ultimately to new applications because it means that a MOF can kinetically recognize a molecule because it's just faster in the adsorption. And there are already a few examples out. For example, the Kitagawa group has shown that carbon monoxide can be kinetically recognized as compared to nitrogen. There's also a shape a selective recognition for xylene separation as demonstrated by Matsuda group. There's also the recognition of CO2 versus methane as um, demonstrated by my group and also the group of uh, Jeff Long. Um, Bang Lin Chen has proposed the propyne-propene separation. The MOF that is switchable and selectively only opens the pore for propyne. And this is important for industrial applications. And Caro has even shown um, um, an external stimulus like an electric field can even change the diffusivity in the membrane and switch a membrane and therefore um, change the selectivity with an electric field. So there are plenty of opportunities, for example, in separation, but also in gas storage with the selective recognition. The vision is that the uh, the MOF only opens its pores for a certain type of gas molecule. But there are also other applications or let's say functions coming up. Um, I think this is also a, a, a bright future because these structural trans um, transformations are ultimately related to physical structural changes like optical changes, which can be used for sensing or electrical changes. We can transform the structural transformation, um, trans use a transducing signal or, or integrate this into electrical sensing if the resistivity is changing, for example. So these 
Transformations can be used for sensing applications. Here, for example, we demonstrated a threshold uh, sensing systems. But I think there's also a bright future in actuation because these structural changes, I mean, this is an actor, something that is moving, that is walking. I'm, this is my dream that MOFs will um, one day start walking. And we have already measured what type of uh, force <clears throat> the MOF can exert if it can lift a load, for example, and the negative gas absorption um, can accomplish a high pressure, actually. So this push out is not only a few kilopascal, but with CO2, it can reach up to 400 kilopascal, um, over 60 PSI, basically. So I think this is also quite promising for actuation. Um, and the group of Maspoch has also shown this macroscopically. You can make a, a moving sort of a bendable system that basically responds with the humidity change, for example. So I think this is also uh, a bright future in actuators and sensors. And the last one is also the switchable catalyst as demonstrated by Hong Kai Zhou. This is also a vision for catalysis. The MOF will selectively only open its pores for a certain substrate, and then only this one will be um, converted. But I'm convinced that it's not only to develop a lot of applications, but there's also a lot to learn in terms of understanding. We are still not yet that we there, there that we understand what is what are the underlying um, energetics. There is good improvement, um, and simulation is very important, but there's still much more to learn to understand the energetic uh, barriers. So I hope I could convince you and fascinate you a little bit with this uh, new material class or not so new maybe anymore, but there's still not a lot of new phenomena to find, not only in applications, but also in understanding fundamentals, um, the energetic stability, the role of host-guest interactions, the particle size, morphology aspects, and I think also um, sample history. And I'm very much in favor of in situ methodologies. I think only if you can look at the MOF, um, develop these methods, then you can achieve a better understanding what structural transformations are going on. I really acknowledge all the funding, especially the ESC grant and the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and also other funding agencies. This is, was a team effort, not my work. I contributed with ideas and paper writing and divide, um, supervising students, of course, and postdocs, but many people, international collaboration. Only through co collaboration, we can advance this field further. I deeply acknowledge also HZB support, the Helmholtz Center in Berlin. And with this, I'm at the end, and I hope we can meet all in presence in 2022. Uh, in September at the MOF conference in Dresden. Wish good health to everyone. Thank you for listening.